dedicated to empowering you with information to make positive choices and be advocates for your overall well-being. Welcome to The Health View. Welcome to The Health View. I'm Yvonne Dunitz, and today my guest is Dr. Paul Austin. He is from the Texas Children's Hospital, professor of urology, Baylor College of Medicine. And our topic today is about bedwetting to potty training. Welcome, Dr. Austin. We're pleased to have you via Skype. Dr. Austin, let's begin this important discussion on how parents and people need to be aware of the whole aspect from what happens urologically when a child begins to get ready for potty training. When does bedwetting occur? Before potty training or after? Well, that's an excellent question and thank you so much, Yvonne, for having me on your show. Uh, the question about bedwetting, well, I guess in some ways it happens before, but, but not really in the sense that we would socially think of bedwetting because a baby's bladder empties different than a older toddler or child's bladder. So initially we're all somewhat incontinent or leak urine during both the day and the night. And of course, babies are in diapers. However, that changes over time. And as it changes over time, a child and parent begins the process of getting children ready to be potty trained. And is there a particular time period where developmentally that it is best to begin potty training? And what are your recommendations about that? Well, potty training is a very important issue to many people. And we take that very seriously and try to advise families and reassure them that their child uh, will all, in all likelihood have no problems toilet training. That being said, however, toilet training can be very individualized. And we know that there are population studies that indicate the time points that children generally uh, attain uh, uh, nighttime continence and are able to be toilet trained. But of course, when you're dealing with individuals, there's going to be some variation. Um, in general, um, the bladder goes through a lot of changes during uh, infancy and onto toddler. And that includes the bladder enlarging, uh, the urine uh, production slowing down a bit, uh, and then also a shift of the control of bladder emptying from being a, a spinal cord kind of level reflex to a more upper uh, brain uh, mediated type of, of, uh, of, of control and voluntarily uh, uh, initiating urination rather than a reflex. So it is a process that develops and generally these age and time points are, are usually around two years of age for girls and uh, around two and a half to three years for boys. So uh, in general, most of the developmental milestones uh, are usually uh, uh, attained in in, in girls sooner than in males, and this also holds true for bladder and potty training, and most girls generally attain bladder control around two to two and a half, and, and uh, boys are around six months later, around two and a half to three. And these are based on uh, two large surveys, uh, one uh, by uh, Dr. Bloom from Michigan, and then also Dr. Brazelton, who recently passed away, also had a, a survey of about 3,000 plus uh, children and looking at the, the timelines of when they achieved uh, toilet training. So these are, are the general kind of time points that most uh, boys and girls will attain uh, potty uh, training. Are there any recommendations that you have for parents to assist in their awareness of how to effectively go, go about potty training of their children? Yes, I think that uh, 
the first and foremost is is just really take a lot of the cues from your child. Um, you know, kids develop differently, and what happens in one child is not always going to be the same for another child. I think if the child begins to express interest, throwing off their diapers, then that is certainly a cue that uh, would strongly encourage the families and the parents to follow. But uh, to to try to impose uh, uh, the parents' uh, timeline uh, will ultimately probably result in a lot of frustration. And uh, personally, one of my children, uh, both boys, uh, attained toilet training at around uh, 20 months of age, very early, and then the other one was three years and about two months, and and uh, it just really varies from child to child, basically. So there is a difference also related to being potty trained necessarily, let's say, during the day versus what happens at night, correct? And that's why they yeah. put on overnight uh, diapers just in case while that process is occurring. Could you explain that? Yes. So the maturational uh, stepwise uh, development of, of bladder and also bowel uh, continence is a little different. So generally, most kids will attain bowel continence prior to bladder continence. And usually the daytime is attained first, uh, particularly in the bladder, before the nighttime continence is achieved. And this is based upon some of the reasons and some of the treatments we use for bedwetting because some of the factors that are involved in this maturational process uh, are different than say the bladder enlarging. They're also related to some uh, upper motor neuron uh, maturation or upper brain maturation and also hormones that our bodies naturally secrete at night that slows down our urine production that's not quite fully developed. So Daytime is usually prior to nighttime, uh, and bowels are generally before uh, the bladder control. So when is it determined that a child, in fact, is having bedwetting? When does it yes. come to the point where potty training has been learned and bedwetting begins? Or is, it, is there a, a mix and integration of the two? Yeah, so we, I, I participated, this is a very good question, because um, ages, again, uh, can be somewhat relative, but in general, we per, I participated on a guidelines that looked at, it was an international group and panel of multidisciplinary providers from various uh, nephrology, urology, pediatrics, gastroenterology, psychology, psychiatry, and we basically looked at when is it considered a problem. And so based upon the World Health Organization, the ICD-10s, and then also the DMS, DSM-5 criteria, generally uh, a nighttime bedwetting is generally around the age of six years of age. And that's also relevant to some of the FDA-approved medications for the treatment of bedwetting as well. So explain this a little further. So a child could, in fact, be potty trained up to the age of about six and potty yes. trained during the day as well as night, but all of a sudden then begin to have bedwetting symptoms? Yes, and that, is, that is true. Go ahead. What, what would be the things that all of a sudden um, make them change from a developmental point physically in their bodies? What causes bedwetting well, to occur? Yes, so there's a, there's a triad, a classic triad of the causes for bedwetting. One is you have to have an adequate reservoir. Your bladder has to be large enough. It has to be stable uh, to hold urine throughout the night without uh, having a spasm or some sort of reflex contraction. Uh, some of that reflex contraction is also involved by another uh, source in this triad, which is the brain. The brain inhibits the brain stem. There's a, there's a P center called the micturition center, which is in the pons of the brain stem. And this uh, center is regulated by several of the upper centers of the brain. And if the circuitry and maturation is not quite fully developed, then the bladder may not be as inhibited during the night when the bladder fills. So the brain is also involved. 
And then finally, uh, we make a hormone called vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. And this is something that's actually made in a circadian kind of rhythm. It goes up at night and goes down during the day. And there are kids who essentially haven't developed this circadian secretion of vasopressin. Uh, and subsequently, that led to the development of a synthetic analog called desmopressin in the 1980s because they studied these uh, subset of children who bedwet and they didn't make this particular hormone. So the brain maturation, uh, the uh, the uh, hormonal secretion that tells the, sl the kidney to slow down, not make as much urine at night, uh, and then also the, the uh, stability and capacity of the bladder, these are all the three features uh, that can result in bedwetting, but may not result in daytime incontinence. And these are also the targets that we use and target when we do therapy for bedwetting. And what does therapy include? When well, does it, first of all, maybe we back up one second. When does a parent, after notif noticing these symptoms of having bedwetting occur, reach out to their pediatrician or see a pediatric urologist for a workup so that this is something that can be treated. A child doesn't have to go through this. They can be helped through it, correct? Correct. And it's a great question because for some reason there's a lot of confusion, it seems, about uh, when to seek help. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know if anyone can give the exact answer for every person except for some guidelines if it's bothering the child, if they're, they're wanting to do sleepovers, if they're wanting to socialize, you know, and it's affecting that, we know that there is an impact on the self-esteem. And so if it's imposing, and that's going to be in the elementary school age generally, uh, then that would be a time that you should seek treatment. At the same time, I do tell parents and families that come in for bad wedding that there is a maturational process and that if you, we have a, the, what's called the rule of 15s. So five, five year olds, 15% of five year olds will wet the bed. 5% of 10 year olds will wet the bed and only 1% of 15 year olds wet the bed. So there's a natural maturational drop off of many of these children. They'll stop wetting the bed over time. Unfortunately, however, I cannot tell them that it's going to be next week, next month or next year. And so, therefore, I don't necessarily recommend that they not do anything, but just reassure them that there is a maturational component, and it's very unusual for, for people to continue to wet the bed throughout their life. It's very, very rare. What types of treatments are available for children who begin to bend wet? Sure. The, the treatments, first of all, are, are usually very common things that most people have already tried, and that is, you know, limiting the consumption of fluids before bedtime. However, that does not mean you dehydrate your child. That's not very nice, and, and it's not very healthy. So we just, everything is in moderation. So you want to limit your fluid intake prior to bedtime. You want to uh, make sure that the child is emptying their bladders well during the day. So what you uh, don't want is a child that may postpone or hold their urine or have some bladder emptying issues that may not be as obvious during the day but can carry on into the night. So we always want to do a um, kind of a, a bladder kind of diary and, and see uh, how often their child is peeing, how often their child is having a bowel movement, these are all things that can affect, affect the bladder behavior. And if these are also an issue, you would want to address that. So generally recommend waking the child up. Uh, many children uh, will wet the bed during various stages of, of sleep. There have been many sleep studies that have been conducted that look at uh, which times do the children wet the bed. And it happens randomly throughout all stages of sleep. So generally, waking a child up at various hours in the middle of the night uh, is not usually very successful, and it also results in a very tired child and also a tired parent. 
So in that case, what do you do? So if you're not waking them up, resulting in a very tired child and a very tired parent, then what is done? Yes. So there's two, there's two main um, uh, treatments for what we call monosymptomatic enuresis, which is, again, no bladder dysfunction. These are kids that only have either a maturational issue with their brain or with their uh, inability to make a hormone at night for, uh, uh, for slowing down the urine production at night. So one of the options is to do a moisture alarm, which is a conditioning therapy, and that targets the brain and arousal. So the arousal mechanisms uh, are what's responsible for suppressing or inhibiting the, the micturition center from telling the bladder to, to empty when the bladder fills uh, overnight. And so this is a classic operant uh, Pavlovian uh, conditioning therapy where you have the bladder fills, the child uh, uh, wets the bed, the alarm sounds, and then they're aroused. And basically over repetition and time, the association of bladder filling with arousal is a learned process that takes about six weeks. So we tell them that it has to really, um, you cannot say that the therapy did not uh, work or was not successful until you had repetition. And six weeks is generally considered enough time for conditioning therapy to, to uh, cure the bedwetting if it's an arousal kind of maturational issue uh, that's the responsible. The other option is to treat a child with desmopressin, which is a synthetic form of the hormone vasopressin that's naturally produced at night, and the child takes that medicine, and they basically will either respond or they won't respond. And we have an escalating dose. There's, uh, it comes in a tablet form uh, in the U.S. Unfortunately, it's not a, uh, a sublingual um, ready melt type tablet uh, that you can put under your tongue as it is in other parts of the world. But in the U.S., we only have the pill. And so uh, the absorption uh, is uh, through the GI tract, and you have to take one tablet. And if that doesn't respond after seven nights, you go to two tablets. It's still not the response you're wanting. And it goes to three tablets a night, and that's the maximum therapy. Neither it works or it doesn't. And in that situation, if it works well, then the child continues to take the therapy until basically uh, they just stop and give it a trial. And usually I recommend six months uh, to just see if they still need the medicine. And if they, uh, the advantage of the, of the desmopressin or the, 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 the pharmacology treatment would be that it's a quick fix, uh, but it doesn't really cure the bedwetting. And it just kind of masks it until their body kicks in and starts making their own vasopressin. And, I tell them that it might be in six months or it could be a year or two years from now. It's time will tell, but eventually they will, will develop that pattern and they'll outgrow it. So the pros and cons, uh, you can see uh, one kind of is a easy and, and is a quick fix, but doesn't cure it. And then the other is a fix, but it's a lot more effort. It's a little bit more disruptive in the household. So we really have many families that gravitate towards one therapy or the other, uh, and I really leave it up to the families. I tell them these are the standard therapies, and that if one therapy doesn't work, then we can always go to the other therapy, and sometimes we do combination therapies, and I tell them these things because at the end of the day, I don't want them to get discouraged because we will eventually find the right combination for their child, but it might take some time, but these are the general uh, options that we empirically uh, present to the families uh, for for bedwetting. And in time, the child, it seems, grows out of it, correct? Because their body begins to develop and physically are, it, are able to handle the urine. And, and are, are you waiting for that developmental approach to finally occur so that physically the body is in the position that it can uh, be aware of the urine and be able to get up and go to the bathroom and go back to sleep and know the signals? In essence, yes. Uh, I mean, it's, again, it's, 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 you have multiple factors at play here. Their bladder has to uh, enlarge and it has to be able to um, be um, regulated by the brain and the, the micturition or pea center of the brain stem. 
And then there also has to be hormonal production that naturally occurs at night that slows down our kidney production uh, so that we don't make as much urine at night and subsequently don't uh, fill the bladder and don't have an accident. So all of these are at interplay and it really varies from child to child which of these components uh, it is. But overall, it is they'll all outgrow it, whichever component or sometimes a combination of these components. And you mentioned earlier in the program that self-esteem most certainly has an impact on a child, especially as it relates to their ability to socially be active. So besides the urological treatment and care, what else do you recommend to a family to provide the supports needed by their child so that they can have a healthy and socially well childhood? Yes. Well, I think this is really, um, thankfully, becoming more appreciated and um, not uh, ignored because uh, there is no question that uh, kids in, in kids socialize and the social socialization is different. But it is imperative that they want to go to a scout camp or they want to go to a band camp or they want to go spend the night or take a school trip. I mean, I, I, I cannot tell you the heart-wrenching stories of kids who will not go on a school trip that the entire class, you know, it's the highlight of their kids growing up at this school and or, you know, the fear of wearing a diaper in, in, in uh, being caught in their sleeping bag. It's just heart-wrenching. So um, it's something that... Um, it's real, uh, and so therefore, you know, it takes a lot of encouragement, patience, and and I think ignoring it is not the right uh, answer. In other words, not getting treatment for bedwetting and saying, oh, you'll just outgrow it. That's not, I think, a fair uh, approach. And then also uh, punishment. I mean, there are reports, it's sad enough, but it's there are reports in the, in the literature of kids being abused and spanked and and just really uh, unsettling things because of something they really can't help and it's not something they're willfully doing and that's something that uh, I think is uh, is something to, to bear in mind but just encouragement um, I also go over family genetics if you if you are a bedwetter your child will have a 44 percent chance of wetting the bed and if your spouse was a bedwetter when they were a child their offspring will have a 77% chance of bedwetting. So there is a genetic component to this. Uh, it, it, it does, uh, it is familial. And, uh, and uh, so, so oftentimes the parents will say, yep, I'm not really that uh, upset about it because it, I was 12 when I stopped wetting the bed. And, and, and that's kind of reassuring that they are understanding. But there are situations where it's not, and it's, it's very sad. It's critical that people are aware of this, Dr. Austin, and I'm, I'm so happy that you're on this program because children should not be punished for bedwetting. It is something that needs assistance and medical care and support uh, because it will affect them for the rest of their lives as far as from a social development. And if people think that this is something that they're doing intentionally, they're just not understanding that that is not the answer that is not the truth of the situation. So if you were to summarize for people the most important information to be aware of related to bedwetting, what would it be? Well, I would say that uh, this is a common uh, uh, problem that occurs in about uh, really seven to, to five percent of the population in school age. It primarily affects males. Uh, there is a genetic uh, component to this. And there are very good treatments for bedwetting. And if your child is bothered, uh, and certainly the family notices this, I would seek help through their pediatrician. And if there's any referral to a specialist that, that particularly focuses on bedwetting, uh, I'm sure the pediatricians will refer them. And, uh, and I would encourage them to seek treatment and not just do nothing. So when you say a specialist, is it a pediatric urologist that would be the specialist that a child would be referred to? In general, it is. Uh, it really varies across the globe. Uh, in the United States, 
the majority of specialists that manage bedwetting is going to be a pediatric urologist. However, there are other specialists that may see it. And in other parts of the world, particularly in Europe, more of my colleagues in nephrology or a kidney medical doctor would be managing uh, uh, bedwetting. So it really varies. But in the U.S., it's primarily pediatric urologists. Okay. So it, do pediatricians themselves manage it? Or is it referred it, it, out? It does, and it, and it varies. And, and um, I, I participated with a, a group of colleagues uh, at the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we have guidelines, and it's available to pediatricians, and it's available to families through their, their uh, pa parent and family access uh, uh, on their websites. Okay. Uh, but it's something that pediatricians do uh, have knowledge and also uh, are capable of assisting families. But like a lot of things, Sometimes, uh, you know, different people have different uh, expertise and levels of expertise, and sometimes uh, these patients will also be referred to as specialists. Is there a particular website that people could go to learn more about this topic? Well, I would say they could go to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, they could also go to the Urology Care Foundation, which also has a, a recent update uh, in the most recent spring issue. Uh, for bedwetting, and they could also go to the International Children's Continent Society, which also has some materials on bedwetting. That's excellent. Dr. Austin, this has been a very informative program. I wish to thank you very much for all that you do. And for our listeners, please remember the important information that Dr. Austin has shared, that bedwetting is something that can be helped and treated. It is not something that should be punished. If anything, it is something a family and a community needs to come together and positively understand and provide the supports that are needed for a child so that they can grow up with a good self-esteem, feel confident about who they are, and be able to have the best childhood experience that they can. Dr. Austin, thank you again. We wish you well, and until next time.